Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Centre Space Q3 2024 Earnings Call. My name is Ezra, and I will be your coordinator today. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad now. If you change your mind, please press star followed by two. I will now hand you over to your host, Josh Plate, at Centre Space to begin. Josh, please go ahead. Good morning. Center Space's Form 10-Q for the quarter ended September 30th, 2024, was filed with the SEC yesterday after the market closed. Additionally, our earnings release and supplemental disclosure package have been posted to our website at centerspacehomes.com and filed on Form 8-K. It's important to note that today's remarks will include statements about our business outlook and other forward-looking statements that are based on management's current views and assumptions. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties discussed in our filing under the section titled Risk Factors and in our other filings with the SEC. We cannot guarantee that any forward-looking statements will materialize, and you're cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. Please refer to our earnings release for reconciliations of any non-GAAP information, which may be discussed on today's call. I'll now turn it over to Center Space's President and CEO, Ann Olson, for the company's prepared remarks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Center Space's third quarter earnings call. With me this morning are Barav Patel, our Chief Financial Officer, and Grant Campbell, our Senior Vice President of Investments and Capital Markets. Before taking your questions, we will briefly cover our results and discuss our outlook for the remainder of 2024. We have a lot of good news to share, starting with earnings of $1.18 per share of core FFO for the third quarter, driven by stable revenue growth and expense control initiatives. We continue to improve and simplify our balance sheet, and subsequent to quarter end, we expanded our presence in the Denver market with the purchase of the Lydian, which we acquired with a combination of attractive long-term assumed mortgage debt and the issuance of OP units at a premium to our stock price. Graham will share more about that transaction momentarily. Rob will discuss our quarterly results, but I want to provide some details on leasing trends. For the third quarter, same-store revenue increased 3% over the same period in 2023. We are proud of this growth on top of the 2023 growth we achieved, which was at the high end of the multifamily public peer group. Same-store new lease tradeouts are seasonally slowing, down 1.2%, while renewal leases increased by 3.2%, resulting in 1.5% blended lease increases for the quarter. Importantly, we achieved these results while also increasing occupancy to 95.3%, which is a 70 basis point improvement over the same period last year. Maintaining occupancy above 95% has been an objective for us, and that focus does have a trade-off relative to new lease pricing. I'll caution against extrapolating our quarter-over-quarter -quarter leasing results, given both the seasonality and our prioritization of occupancy. Much of our portfolio footprint has experienced lower supply than national averages, and our results benefited from that during the quarter. North Dakota communities continue to lead the portfolio with blended spreads of 5.4%, while our Nebraska communities also saw strong blended growth at 3.3%. I'd like to highlight our largest market of Minneapolis, where we recognize 1.2% blended rent increases. Minneapolis once again ranked among the strongest absorption markets nationally in the quarter. After several years of outside supply here, the recent absorption and lower anticipated future deliveries should act as a tailwind for our portfolio. Resident retention remains elevated at over 58% for the quarter, which has helped drive occupancy and bolsters our blended leasing spreads during the seasonally slower months. Resident health remains strong, Though up slightly from last year, bad debt year-to-date is trending similar to historical norms, and rent-to-income levels remain sustainable at 23%. Renting, compared to the increased cost of homeownership, remains a compelling value for our residents across our markets. As a reflection of our operating results and our capital markets activity, we are raising the midpoint of our full-year core FFO guidance by a penny to $4.86 per share. While our revenue results have trended to the low end of our initial guidance expectations for 2024, there are offsets on the expense side that result in positive NOI growth, and we are getting that to the bottom line. These include items directly related to revenue, such as lower utility expense and turnover costs, 
as well as savings from leveraging technology and centralizing certain property management functions. In the third quarter, we issued approximately 1.5 million shares on our ATM, raising $105 million. Proceeds were used to redeem the entirety of our Series C preferred shares. The opportunity to both simplify our capital structure and improve our balance sheet while improving cash flow and share liquidity was attractive, but we are mindful of our valuation and intend to remain disciplined about our capital markets activities. As we sit today, we feel very well positioned to advance our vision to be a premier provider of apartment homes in vibrant communities and drive consistent earnings growth for our investors. Part of that vision includes a new community, the Lydian, and I'll turn things over to Grant to discuss that acquisition and the transaction market more broadly. Grant? Thanks, Ann, and good morning. Earlier this month, we completed the acquisition of the Lydian in Denver. This 129-home community also features 23,000 square feet of fully leased commercial and street-level retail space with front door access to a light rail station. The 2018 built property is located within one and a half miles of three other center space communities, providing opportunity to leverage our geographically proximate operating platform and broader Denver portfolio scale. We are excited to add the Lydian to our portfolio and introduce our operating platform with implementation of best practices. After execution of our business plan, we expect the community to generate an NOI yield in the mid to high 5% range. The Lydian also provided us a financial structure that advanced external growth at attractive terms. Specifically, our purchase was funded via the assumption of attractive long-term mortgage debt with a balance of $35 million at a 3.72% interest rate maturing in 2037. Along with the issuance of common operating partnership units at $76.42 per unit. Additionally, the community is part of a tax increment financing district where we anticipate receiving over $6 million of principal and interest payments funded by the real estate taxes we pay on the property over the duration of the TIF agreement. Looking at the transaction market more broadly, we continue to see thawing in the market with both a smaller gap between buyer and seller expectations and higher levels of conviction from buyers leading to increased liquidity and investor demand. Our belief is transaction volume will continue increasing and more actionable opportunities will present themselves to the market as we move into 2025. We want to take advantage of growth opportunities when they align with our strategic initiatives. On the pricing side, well-located, higher-quality communities and markets such as Denver have recently been trading at 4.75 to 5% cap rates. With 23% of our NOI coming from this market, this highlights the attractive relative valuation at which our stock currently trades. Demand for apartments remains strong, and on the supply side, we are past the peak of new deliveries in each of our largest markets, and construction starts have declined materially. As all our markets move into the net absorption phase with deliveries tapering, we are excited for our future growth potential. And with that, I'll turn it over to Barav to discuss our overall financial results and outlook for the remainder of 2024. Thanks, Grant, and good morning, everyone. Last night, we reported core FFO of $1.18 per diluted share for the third quarter, driven by a 2.8% year-over-year increase in same-store NOI. Revenues from same-store communities increased by 3% compared to the third quarter of 2023, driven by a 2.2% increase in revenue per occupied home and a 70 basis point year-over-year increase in weighted average occupancy, which stood at 95.3% for the quarter. Same store expenses were up by 3.2% year-over-year, driven by higher non-controllable expenses with non-reimbursable losses and insurance premiums as the primary drivers of year-over-year growth. Controllable expenses growth remained muted, up only 80 basis points compared to Q3 last year, as savings in repairs and maintenance and on-site compensation were offset by increased administrative and marketing spend. Turning to guidance, we updated our 2024 expectations in last night's press release. We now expect core FFO of $4.86 at the midpoint, which is an increase of one cent compared to our prior expectations and an increase of six cents versus our initial guidance released in February. We are maintaining the midpoint of year-over-year same-store NOI growth guidance at 3.5%, while lowering our expectations for both revenue growth and expense growth. 
With market rent softening more than expected, same-store revenues are now projected to increase 3 to 3.5% for the year. The decline in revenue is projected to be offset by lower growth in same-store expenses, which are now projected to increase by 25 to 3.25%. Moving on to other components of guidance, we now expect G&A and property management expenses for the year to range between 26.5 to 27 million, and interest expense to range between 37.3 to 37.6 million. Increased interest expenses, primarily driven by the debt assumed in conjunction with the Lydian acquisition. Our expectations regarding value-add spend and same-store recurring capex per unit are unchanged. After the Lydian, no additional acquisitions, dispositions, issuances, or borrowings are factored into our guidance. On the capital front, as Anne noted, we have taken a series of steps to further strengthen our balance sheet. We've sold nearly 1.6 million shares year-to-date under our ATM program, raising gross proceeds of nearly $114 million. These proceeds were used to both retire the Series C preferred and decrease the balance on our line of credit. While we will always be mindful of the impact of equity issuance, the coupon and interest rate respectively on these were both in the mid to high 6% range. Issuing equity in a manner that improved both our cash flow per share and our leverage profile was a logical choice. The redemption of the Series C preferred alone is expected to increase our cash flow per year by roughly $2.3 million based on the implied dividend yield of approximately 4.2% on our common stock relative to the 6.6% coupon on the preferred stock we redeemed. Combined with the recast of our line of credit, which we announced last quarter, we have a well ladder debt maturity schedule that performer for the Lydian acquisition has a weighted average cost of 3.61% and a weighted average time to maturity of 5.9 years. To conclude, it was a very active and productive quarter across the board. We achieved strong operating results, strengthened our balance sheet, simplified our capital structure, and expanded our portfolio in one of our desired markets. We look forward to sustaining this momentum as we close out 2024. And with that, I will turn the line back to the operator for your questions. Thank you very much. To ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad now. When prepping to ask your question, please ensure your device is unmuted locally. If you change your mind, please press star followed by two. Our first question comes from Brad Heffern with RBC Capital Markets. Brad, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, You mentioned market rent softening more than expected. Is that also a greater softening than the normal seasonal trend? And what would you attribute that to? Good morning, Brad. Thanks. Um, I think we... It is more than we expected, more than the seasonal expectation that we had, just slightly more. As you know, we always expect that they soften at this time of year. They happened a little bit earlier. Uh, We talked about that last quarter. We really saw the peak leasing in May. And I think we attribute it mostly to the supply demand. And this is just against our expectations. But I think as we look at, you know, um, across our markets, we believe that the rents we're getting are, you know, at market, we're using not very uh, many concessions. So we feel good about where they are. I think our expectations for the year were just a little bit higher. Okay, got it. Um, and then maybe for Rob, just looking at the, the new revenue growth guidance, it implies a pretty substantial drop 3Q to 4Q, something like going from 3 to 1.6 plus or minus. Um, the over-year comps actually look a little easier, and I assume you don't have many leases expiring anyway. So I'm just curious what would lead to that large of a drop. Yes. Morning, Brad. So with respect to revenue guidance, at the midpoint, we would, you know, we would expect to report about 1.5 to 3% for revenue growth. At the midpoint, our blended assumption is really flat for the quarter. On a year-over-year basis, we do expect some rubs favorability um, as we have baked in a slightly higher utilities cost in uh, in, in our Q4 numbers. And and additionally, we also have less concessions we expect to utilize in this quarter as we bolstered occupancy going into it. So overall, the 1.3 to 
3, 1.5% NOI growth at the midpoint is really driven by expenses, mainly on the non-controllable side with, you know, with insurance premiums and losses expected to be pretty high compared to last year. Okay. Um, and then last for me, do you have any preliminary read on the October leasing stats? Yeah, we, we, it's very early in the month. Um, you know, uh, we are cut off. We usually allow some time after a date. So, uh, they're, I think reflected in the guidance, as, as Barab said, we did bring the revenue down. We, we do believe that, uh, the blended will be flat. So um, new leases have remained slightly negative and renewals have remained slightly positive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from John Kim with BMO. John, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so for your third quarter lease uh, results, um, just trying to isolate September. It looks like new lease rates were down 3%, renewals below three, a blended of roughly plus 80 basis points. And now you're saying that it's going to go flat or expected to go flat in the fourth quarter. So what component um, between new, lease, new leases and renewals are driving that number lower? Hey, John. Um, so, with respect to fourth quarter's uh, uh, expectations, we expect renewals to average somewhere in the mid twos, and we expect new leases to um, average uh, a negative, um, you know, mid to rate uh, on on the trade outs. So that's why it's balancing our expectation with respect to renewals is uh, is fifty percent. That's what's driving our base case expectations. And do you have a, a view on what your earning is going to be for next year? Or is it too uh, too early to determine? Uh, it's you know we are working through it at this point. You know the earning for this year is close to two point four percent. With respect to next year, it's going to be less than one percent at this point. But we are working through our estimates, um, and and that can change as uh, as uh, leasing trends evolve. Um, just really quickly on the Denver acquisition, you guys mentioned a mid to high 5% yield once you stabilize the asset under your new um, platform. How long will it take to, to get to that level? And if you can comment on the going in cap rate. Yeah, good morning, John. This is Grant. Uh, from a going in perspective, uh, NOI yield there is a blended five. Uh, we think the operational best practices and operating initiatives that we alluded to in the prepared remarks, you know, some of those are, you know, first 90 to 120 day items uh, in terms of the, the service that we provide to the residents on a day to day basis. And then there's other items, you know, related to things like uh, potential property tax savings, mark to market rents as you roll through uh, the lease expiration schedule that, you know, we'll take. 12 to 18 months. So uh, kind of two different buckets, but, you know, really looking at kind of 18 months for holistic implementation. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Our next question is from Connor Mitchell with Piper Sandler. Connor, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so it sounds like retention rates might be a little bit higher in the quarter than they have previously. Uh, could you just kind of give us some more color on why you might think that the retention rates are higher, uh, what might be driving them this year or the quarter, and then finally just do you guys plan on uh, disclosing turnover or retention uh, in the supplemental in the future? That's a good question, Connor. We are always looking for ways to enhance our supplemental. So we'll note that down um, and consider that for future publications. With respect to the retention rates being higher, we're you know in month 18 of seeing higher retention rates across last year, they were slightly higher and, and year to date, they've, they've been higher. 
We've also seen the traffic pattern. Um, it's showing that people are looking earlier than they had been in the past. And so I think some of that is uh, more choice in the markets, right? Supply has people out looking and, and making decisions a little bit earlier. And then also, you know, we have seen a pretty dramatic drop of, across the industry in people leaving to buy homes. And with the high cost of housing, you know, renting as a necessity is affecting more, uh, a larger percentage of the population. And, and we have a lot of renters in, in that category. You know, our average rents are, um, you know, right around $1,600, just below $1,600. So, you know, most of our residents where two or three years ago or pre-COVID may have been looking to move out to buy a house, that percentage was about 25%. That's fallen to 12 to 15 percent uh, post COVID. So I think that is impacting our retention rates. Okay, and then um, just kind of along the same lines, as you kind of think about the retention rates and uh, balance renewals with new leases, could you guys just give us um, some color on kind of how you how you think about uh, pricing renewals? whether that's all the way up to markets or maybe partially just to offset any uh, leasing costs for new uh, leases instead. Just any any color you might have there would, would be helpful. Yeah, sure, Connor. We take the approach that, um, you know, lease new renewal pricing goes out 75 days before the renewal actually happens. And during that time, you know, we want to make that price competitive, but it really depends property by property and lease by lease how far that individual resident is away from market. So if they're only 5% away from market, we might take that renewal all the way to market. You know, if they're 20% away from market, it, they might go up 10. If they're above market, they might be, um, you know, coming down slightly. So we want to make that renewal pricing attractive, both because it offsets turn costs, but also because having those renewals, um, you know, committed to having people that are committing to staying there helps us set the new lease pricing in order to maximize total overall revenue. So if we really push hard on renewals, we risk that less people renew and then the new lease pricing softens more. So we really take the approach that we're trying to maximize overall revenue. We do factor in um, that there are costs associated with with turning the residents and, um, you know, so we're really focused on giving the best resident experience to make them uh, want to stay with us and also providing the best value when we approach pricing. Okay, very helpful. And then maybe just one quick one for Barab as well. Um, you guys talk about like forecasting utilities, which drives expenses uh, and revenue for, for rubs. Um, just kind of a big picture, wondering, um, when you guys are looking at the forecasted utilities, does it essentially uh, net out for earnings or how impactful might we uh, think about it for, for earnings in terms of revenue and expenses to the bottom line? Sure. Um, so with respect to utilities, um, we pass through 80% of gas utilities and most of the other utilities costs. So for the most part, we feel like we're hedged, although when you look at our, um, our P&L, you'll see revenues coming through in the form of rubs um, and the expenses going up in the form of utilities expenses. So there's a, a gross up on, on the income statement, but for the most part, given the amount we charge through, we feel like we're pretty well hedged, especially on the gas rub side, which we rolled out uh, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, where we passed through 80% of the cost. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Cooper Clark with Wells Fargo. Cooper, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you for taking the question. Just wanted to ask about some of the moving pieces as it relates to your insurance renewal coming up in mid to late November. Wondering what type of growth you're expecting and how much wildfire concerns in Denver may have an impact. Morning, Cooper. Yeah, we are in uh, in the final stages of our renewal. We don't really have any definitive 
uh, color to provide. Um, you know, initially we had expected a pretty favorable renewal cycle. However, some of the recent activity, especially the, the storms in, uh, in in Florida, may have an impact as as carriers are kind of estimating their their exposure there. Um, we haven't heard anything specific about um, the wildfires in Denver yet. Um, although we are waiting with bated breath uh, to find out, um, you know, what the, the renewal looks like. Early indications were, again, as I said, very favorable, but the recent activity uh, may have some impact. But hopefully we'll be able to report something on that front soon. We do renew uh, in the next month or so. Um, so we are in the final stages of that. Awesome. Thank you. And then just as one follow up, wondering if you could provide an update on where bad debt was for the quarter and any color on certain markets where you may have more elevated levels of bad debt. Certainly um, for the for the third quarter, we were about 45 to 50 basis points in, in terms of bad debt from a year to date perspective that puts us towards the high end of our expected range of 30 to 40 basis points. And we are expecting the same levels to continue. Um, as we look across markets, there aren't really any broader trends uh, to glean from any of our markets. I think it's just kind of uh, relatively spread out across our markets and so nothing specific uh, you know, with respect to a market or two uh, that's worth noting. Awesome, thank you. Our next question is from Rob Stevenson with Janie. Rob, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, guys. Um, and was the new lease growth of negative 1.2% in the third quarter driven mainly by Minneapolis and Denver, or was that fairly widespread across the portfolio and any markets where new lease growth was still meaningfully positive for you guys? Yeah, good morning, Rob. I'd say, you know, we're still seeing a lot of strength in our North Dakota markets and across Nebraska, but um, generally all the markets slow down right now. So the drivers are, you know, we are seeing a bigger decline in Denver, Minneapolis, and then other Mountain West. Typically the markets that had, that's a market, that's Rapid City and Billings, where we saw, you know, tremendous lease growth during COVID. And so there has been some leveling out in that market um, that's led those to be a little more negative than others, but uh, we are still seeing strong growth, you know, really North Dakota where we've had no supply um, and then also across the Nebraska markets. Okay. And then what technology savings on the expense side are still left for you guys to realize and how much additional spend over the next 18 months are you anticipating for your various tech programs going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. We have really fully implemented all of the technology stack that we're currently looking at. So I'd say that from an expense side, that is behind us. Um, the exception to that would be the smart rent implementation, which we really consider value add. About 70% of our portfolio has uh, the smart rent implemented fully in it, and we plan to identify additional properties for 2025. So, um, but with respect to efficiencies on the operating side, really we're looking at adoption and then how our staffing models can change given the implementation and adoption of that technology. And um, like, like a lot of companies across the industry, we have centralized certain positions uh, within our property teams. So rather than have an assistant community manager at every asset, we now have those in, um, you know, regional remote positions. So we're really trying to look forward and say, what are the other impacts that the implementation that we did with technology, what do those have on staffing models, operations, you know, data efficiencies, and moving forward there. So we're still harnessing some of those. I think next year will be the, uh, you know, we'll probably see a true full year of savings from uh, staffing model implementations. 
Okay, that's great. And then um, last one for me, um, given your current NOI contribution from Denver post Lydian acquisition, how are you thinking about future acquisitions in that market? Are you going to be comfortable taking that up into the 30s like Minneapolis? And given your comments on cap rates in Denver, will you look to maybe sell an existing Denver asset in order to buy another one with more upside? And so how are you guys thinking about the optimal size and exposure of your Denver portfolio going forward? Yeah, this is something we think a lot about. We are seeing more and more opportunities in Denver. Um, you know, with operations like we have in Minneapolis and Denver come opportunities. And while we like that, you know, we really need true external growth like the Lydian um, in other markets so that we could grow out of that. We are, you know, actively looking in markets across the Mountain West and uh, seeking out opportunities. So, you know, ideally we would like those market exposures to stay below 25%, um, but, you know, it's going to take us some time to work through that, both with external growth and, and how the portfolio has changed over time. So it might rise a little bit on its way to, uh, to a stabilized, you know, maybe 20 to 25% of the portfolio. Okay, thanks guys, appreciate the time this morning. Our next question is from Michael Gorman with BTIG. Michael, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. Um, Grant, if I could just go back to the Denver acquisition for a second, is it possible to kind of break down as you talk about the improvement in the yield, kind of how, how much of that is directly in control of, of center space in terms of operating efficiencies? So how much is coming from the expense side versus that kind of mark-to-market piece that you spoke about. Um, and then I guess secondarily to that, I, I, how do you think about market rent growth as you talk about that improved yield? Is that baked in there at all as well? Yeah, good morning, Mike. Uh, appreciate the question. You know, things like mark-to-market rents and potential tax savings that we alluded to, you know, I think one, um, they are in our control, if you will, in the sense that, you know, we uh, appeal taxes in the normal course on all assets and communities that we own. We think there's a very logical path to achieve some of these savings. Obviously, there's a counterparty there that, you know, we have to solicit feedback from, but we think there's a very logical path to achieve those savings. Uh, mark-to-market rents, you know, we, we've been... Um, fair to conservative in our underwriting of this asset. So, uh, you know, for instance, our uh, year one pro forma here has, you know, one and a half to 1.75% kind of top line scheduled rent growth, uh, which we think is a, a very measured um, target and, and base case scenario that perhaps we could outperform. You know, the reason we've taken that approach is we do understand that um, we do have to work through lease expiration curve initiatives to kind of reposition that to to our operating uh, standards and our operating practices, and, and we've tried to account for that in the underwriting. Um, on the resident experience side, uh, I think it's harder to, you know, put a metric on, you know, being present, providing high-touch service, having a smile on your face. You know, it's, it's harder to put uh, a number on that from a yield perspective and say this is what it's going to achieve. Uh, but we do know and do believe, you know, that's going to lead to higher retention levels, higher satisfaction of our residents, uh, and we've been able to, you know, bake in those assumptions into the base case. So um, different buckets, different initiatives that we're focused on, and, you know, we think in the aggregate, those are the things that take it from that blended five yield that I talked about pro forma year one to that mid to mid to high five. Okay, thanks for thanks for the detail there. And then, um, you know, maybe Anne, I'm just trying to square some of the commentary here. It sounds like your markets are generally past the the kind of the peak impact or at least the peak supply. Um, so I'm just trying to understand as we think about the revenue picture here. Are we seeing any signs of stress out of out of the tenants? I know you I know you talked about relatively strong renter base, but we bad debt back half of the year is going to be higher. Um, definitely, the revenue expectations are down. I mean, are there any other 
demand metrics or tenant health metrics that you're seeing maybe a little bit of additional stress um, beyond just uh, any impact from supply? Thanks, Mike. I, I don't, we don't believe so that we're seeing additional stress. So, you know, the rent to income levels have remained healthy. Our bad debt, well, you know, it's picked up slightly. I mean, we're still talking about 40 to 50 basis points. Um, this is a really stable level that we could expect almost in any portfolio. I think relatively to other public peers, much lower uh, bad debt. And I do want to call your attention to, while we're past the peak of supply, there's still is quite a bit of absorption to go. So, you know, we still do see some softening in the rents and not only just seasonality, but it has been a little softer as markets continue to absorb. As I mentioned, Minneapolis has been, you know, one of the leaders in absorption, but we're not all the way through it in that market either. So, you know, there still is a lot of vacancy in these markets, new projects that are still in lease up. Um, but as we work through that into next year, and then with the lack of deliveries, you know, that really should be a tailwind for us. But overall, I think the, you know, we aren't seeing any other demand drivers and or evidence in the data of, um, you know, any uh, stress to the consumer and our residents. Great, thanks so much for the time. Thank you very much. Just as a reminder, to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad now. When prepping to ask your question, please ensure your device is unmuted locally. Our next question comes from Mason Guell with Center Space. Mason, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Can you talk more about what you are seeing in Denver, maybe on the new versus renewal rates? and then the supply and demand outlook in your submarket. Yeah, I, um, why, Grant, why don't you go ahead and start with uh, the supply picture um, with respect to the submarkets, and, and then I can address the what we're seeing on new and renewal in Denver. Morning, Mason. Um, I'll start real quick by top side, kind of, framing where we are in Denver. You know, that is our target market with the highest levels of supply. Currently, about 4.8% of existing stock under construction. That represents about 15,000 apartment homes. You know, that percentage is down notably from 11% in 2023. And when we look at next 12-month deliveries, you know, those are forecasted at 8,400 apartment homes. Uh, which is below 22 and 23 delivery levels in that market, uh, which averaged about 11,000 and certainly below the past 12 months. Uh, when we look at our submarkets, you know, continue to see um, higher levels of recent deliveries uh, in certain urban pockets, uh, along with higher levels of recent deliveries in 2024 in certain suburban pockets. Notably, the East Metro, the Aurora area has had a lot of recent deliveries. We do not own communities there. Uh, our submarkets feel uh, relatively insulated uh, compared to some of the other locations that have experienced large influx of product. Um, you know, if I think about the tech center, uh, southern part of the metro where we own a community, a lot of that land is built out. Uh, northern part of the metro, um, you know, it, it's really isolated to a couple communities in a lot of situations where we own where we own products. So uh, feeling relatively insulated in the suburban markets and, you know, have seen that influx in the urban core uh, in certain pockets. And Mason, as, as we look at the Denver, you know, data in, as an individual market, you know, our occupancy there is it's about 95 percent. We also have retention a little bit over 50% there. Our renewal rates, uh, the trade outs, you know, kind of most recent full month would be uh, slightly over one, 1.2, 1.3. And the new lease trade outs are just slightly over two. So um, some differential there, but, you know, more renewals than the new leases. And again, going into these quarters, it's a very small sample size given our lease expiration profile. 
Thank you. And on expenses, are there any one-time items this quarter that help the moderation, or are there any expected for the rest of the year? Morning, Mason. Um, I'll take that one. So, uh, uh, with an OPEX, we had benefit from adjusting our health insurance reserve in in, in the third quarter. Uh, so that kind of did provide uh, you, you know some uh, you, you know some positive variance. Uh, now that that's typical. We, we reassess our reserves uh, throughout the year, but typically any adjustments are are made in the third quarter, or the fourth quarter. So although uh, there is an impact there. Uh, it's it's also something that is typically expected around this time of the year when we adjust our reserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the Q and A session. I will now hand back to Anne for any closing remarks. I'd like to thank our teams for their outstanding efforts year to date, and I look forward to meeting with many of you in Las Vegas at the upcoming REIT World Convention. Thank you all for joining this morning and have a great Tuesday. Thank you very much everyone for joining. That concludes today's call. You may now disconnect to your lines.